Good evening. I'm Larry Norman, Deputy Provost for the Arts at the University of Chicago, and I'm delighted to invite you to this evening's Art Speaks event. Uh, I am actually going to introduce my distinguished colleague who will be introducing our very special uh, guests tonight, uh, George Lewis, joined by Alexander von Schlippenbach and the AACM. So we're going to have a lot of fun. And I want to say a couple of words about the Art Speaks programs before I introduce uh, Arnold Davidson. Um, the Art Speaks program was founded seven years ago in order to preview and look ahead and dream about what an arts initiative at the University of Chicago would be and what our future Logan Arts Center, which is rising from the ground south of the Midway and will be inaugurated in the spring of 2012, would be and would do. And in particular, it was dedicated to the dream of expanding the bounds of the arts and their place in a university, sometimes a too constrained place, expanding those bounds uh, first by really thinking about the arts, arts in the full context of the research university, all the different disciplines, the full panoply of the intellectual life here. And uh, tonight's event uh, is very indicative of that because uh, George Lewis is here in the framework of a seminar on improvisation in the philosophy department. He's been engaged in discussions across the university and we're gonna hear a little bit more about that from Arnold Davidson. But the second ambition, second way in which we want to expand the arts at the university is to think a little bit beyond uh, the university, uh, to think about the neighborhoods and the city beyond us. And I was very happy that part of this residency included an event downtown, and we're very happy tonight to have a public event and to welcome all of those of you uh, who come from beyond the walls of our university. So welcome again, and now let me introduce my very, very distinguished colleague, Arnold Davidson, a great specialist of contemporary European philosophy, of the history of moral and political philosophy, the history of the philosophy of religion and the social sciences. Arnold Davidson is the Robert Anderson Distinguished Service Professor in, I need to get this right, the Department of Philosophy, the Department of Comparative Literature, the Committee on the Conceptual and Historical Study of the Sciences, and the Divinity School. Uh, so I think just going to faculty meetings expands the bounds of what scholarship is in Arnold Davidson's case. He really is a one-man interdisciplinary center, um, and his Books are too numerous and wonderful to enumerate here. I mean, in addition to works such as The Emergence of Sexuality from Harvard University Press, I think uh, there's a lot of Arnold's works uh, that demonstrate a particular concern and talent that those of us who run into him regularly in the halls of Weebolt or Classic Hall know. And that is how much he values uh, sort of the improvisational and creative act of conversation, the exchange of ideas uh, in spoken word. And that's seen in works such as Michel Foucault and his interlocutors. It's seen in his wonderful book of discussions and conversations uh, with the great French philosopher uh, Pierre Adot. And so it's really a particular pleasure to have Arnold uh, direct a conversation after uh, the concert this evening, as well as introducing our guest tonight. Thank you, Arnold. So you don't okay, great. Thank you. Good evening. I've taught at the University of Chicago for 25 years, but this quarter has been unlike any previous quarter because I've had the extraordinary good fortune of co-teaching a seminar with Professor George Lewis entitled Improvisation as a Way of Life. And in the seminar, we discuss improvisation not just in music, but in a variety of dimensions of both individual and social life. And when we were first talking about our course, we discussed the possibility of organizing a concert, especially since it's the 45th anniversary of the AACM. And thanks to the very generous support of a very wide and diverse group of centers, departments, journals, the provost's office, all of those names listed on the program, we were able to bring this idea to fruition tonight. 
I'd like to especially thank, I can't thank everybody, but I'd like to especially thank the Center for Disciplinary Innovation of the Frankie Institute for the Humanities and its director, Professor James Chandler. That's the sponsoring department of, or the sponsoring institution of George Lewis's visit here. And also the Logan Center, and especially the executive director, William Michael. And I'd also like to mention Dara Epson, who has attended to every detail of tonight's concert with both passion and efficiency. A rather rare combination. <laughs> As you can see from the program, we begin with a piece called Interactive Trio, followed by a discussion. Then there'll be a brief intermission and in the second half of the program, the great black music ensemble of the AACM with Alexander von Schlippenbach and George Lewis will play. So I'm going to give no further introduction and just say it's, for me, an enormous pleasure that we have tonight Alexander von Schlippenbach, George Lewis, and interactive trio.
One of the things we know is that we all heard this at the same time. Right. They didn't know what was going to happen. You didn't know what was going to happen. And so we've all had the same experience. And that's part of, I think, what we wanted to talk about. Right. It's this idea of the, you know, I, st I started having this thing. I did it first with Barry, you know, Barry Guy. And uh, we were in Belfast. And I said, well, look, why don't we have a, they asked us about having a pre-concert discussion. I said, what gets, what's the point of that? I mean. You know, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I mean, I spent, the, you know, I spent most of the day preparing the computer so that I wouldn't know what we were going to do. So, I mean, so, so, so uh, you know, it's better. So we all have a post-concert discussion. And after the concerts, we have a, you know, better idea of what we're doing. And you can all sort of chime in. There's a microphone there. And, um, you know, we don't have to give you the straight poop. I mean, you could just get up and give us your impressions and we'll, try to, you know, or, you know, complaints maybe, or, you know, or, or you know, impressions or comments or, or whatever. Um, I'll just say that um, on the, just in terms of what we were doing, um, you know, Interactive Trio is kind of like uh, something I've kind of settled on. It's, it's kind of a settled technology for me, uh, um, um, I guess, since uh, the, um, well, this, computer program is basically a version of the one that uh, played my piano concerto at Carnegie Hall in 2004, um, which was quite a long time ago, it's six years, and it did pretty much the same thing in terms of the basic technique, that is, we strung microphones around the orchestra, it was a full orchestra, and, and uh, basically um, the computer kind of basically improvised through the entire concerto, including all the cadenzas and all that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, and you know, I've gotten to the point where I kind of trust these things to kind of go out and play. I'm not, you know, it's not, I'm not really worried about, I mean, they play better at times, they play worse at times. Sometimes you wish you could get its attention. Sometimes there's things that really did, that I thought were pretty good. And I mean, what was your impression about the, what we just did? I mean, what do you think? Oh, yeah. Uh, I know George for a while already. Well, yeah. What, what is it, did we discover? Twenty years or so. Yeah. At least twenty and, years. I think not more. And we had just a few times uh, a chance to play together, and uh, we did a thing similar to this before a few years. And for me, it was a quite a new experience because I love to play with him as a human being, but <laughs> that was a kind of machine between us which uh, reacts on what I'm doing, and so I have a kind of alter ego between me and George. And this makes the thing, brings it up to a new level for me as well as a player, uh, because I have to maybe 
interact in a different way, which is an excitement. And for tonight, I found already a progress, if I'm allowed to say. Yeah, it, I think it played better than in yeah. Berlin, yeah. Or the one in Paris was pretty good. Yeah. I mean, there, the one in Paris, there were three pianos, you know, two uh, alter egos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And you know they can also play with each other too. So the thing is, it was like this, this triumvirate, this network of piano mm -hmm. players. And um, you know, it was at, at Earcom, it was like um, you know, sort of home, curious homecoming, sort of like this one in a funny way. You know, um, yeah, I've I've heard it play several times, both live and um, and recorded um, in Berlin. It was almost the same configuration. It was also a violinist. And it, it did play quite differently. And it's interesting that one finds it very easy to say, it played better, it didn't play better, it did this, it did that, in the same way one would about, uh, about the musicians who, after all, sometimes play, play better and sometimes play worse. Um, and it's interesting that today, um, it both had some solo parts, and then it laid out for a while. Uh, while the two of you were playing, and it's curious when people's experience, I've, I've heard people play with it for the first time, and they usually say to George, well, what, how should I think of it? I mean, what, what should I do? And uh, I know they often think that somehow they're going to be able to control it, and then they kind of get upset when they can't. Um, maybe that happens with human musicians as well, I suspect it does. But they think somehow they should be better able to control it. And then they find the camp. And what I found is interesting in listening to people talk about their experiences with it is after they play for a while with it, they stop thinking about it as it. And they just play with it. Well, that's what you would do in any environment as an improviser. I think you just improvise with the environment. And we've had our course now for about, I guess it's the eighth week mm. or something, and uh, one of the things we've discovered is that uh, after a while, you, whatever you do at, in, in your life as an improvising person, I think the, today's, week, today's readings about uh, farming in West Africa called it coping skills, mm -hmm. uh, basically coping with, you know, various, you know, uh, you know <clears throat> conditions as they present themselves. And, and so in the end, you, you forget about all that. You just respond to the environment. I mean, that's what people are going to do. And, and you know, then you, if you do anything else, you kind of overly privilege some aspect of the experience to the exclusion of all the others. I mean, one of the first people to perform with a very early version of this was Douglas Ewart, who will be um, on uh, the, uh, the part of the Great Black Music Ensemble uh, coming up. And in, in 1984, we did a very early version of this in, in Paris uh, for, uh, you know, I guess it was basically a, a computer orchestra, a kind of three really old, you know, Apple IIs, if you believe that, three of them, uh, and cooked up in some network or other. And there were four musicians. Uh, besides Douglas, there was uh, uh, Joël Leandre, Derek Bailey, and Steve Lacey. And we were all having a, they filmed it. So it just showed the film on TV. And so at a certain point, you could probably find it. It's called Rainbow Family. It's probably one of those things that's on YouTube somewhere now. And at a certain point, we're having a conference. And people are talking about, you know, at a certain point, I've, I think Douglas might have even said something very uncomplimentary about the computer, almost sort of scatological, like, you know, F this computer, you know, <laughs> or something like that, you know. And then, and then, he, then he sort of, well, the idea was to break everybody out of the idea that we were, we were all supposed to worship the machine. You know, a lot of how electronic music goes, where the electronic thing is the star and everyone else has to receive the background and kind of be worshipful. Whereas what we're trying to do is we're trying to just have it be another aspect of the environment. And, uh, and if it can contribute something, it can contribute on the basis of what it hears. Uh, so as if it's not listening, it can't really contribute anything so that we need. Um, so that in the end, Douglas, I remember him saying something like, well, the computer is an improviser, but it doesn't have quite the same experience that we do. Uh, so I deal with that, he said. And I thought that was the, a very prosaic, a very effective way of, of handling that situation. So I'm, I'm curious, I wanted to ask Alex that 
since you've recorded a lot of piano duo albums, um, sometimes, sometimes tunes, Thelonious Monk and other things, and sometimes completely free. When you play with, with this piano, do you think about it in a different way than when you're playing a piano duo? Yes, I do, because I, oh, oh, sorry. Yes, of course, uh, because I have to be conscious about uh, the thing that is reacting on some things I am doing in another way, in an unpredictable, uh, and it's also unpredictable if I play with somebody, yeah? but it's anyway uh, different because I'm always thinking about the thing, and I can stop and it goes on. So when I improvise with a player and I stop, there's no piano anymore. Now I stop at the piano. It's right, that's right there. It's, it doesn't uh, know the when the end is. is. It doesn't know when the end is. Yeah, that's it. And uh, it's, um, I hope I don't uh, go too much uh, far away from the subject. Uh, there was an interesting question, can you make mistakes hmm. in this music? And uh, our friend Evan Parker had a good answer. The mistake is missing the chance. Mm. Yeah, yeah missing the chance Excellent. to do something. I mean, sometimes you can decide to do nothing, but there is, of course, there are points. They require something, and you should do something. <laughs> and when you miss this, then it's gone. So, but maybe sometimes better it's gone than you do a wrong thing. But uh, missing the chance is, uh, I think a basic uh, idea about making a mistake in this music, because sometimes we are asked, can you make mistakes? And so it's not like an interpretation of, uh, of written music. You can make many definite mistakes, but a mistake in this music is something different. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's, I think that idea of missing an opportunity is something that we can pretty much empathize with around here, can't we? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think everybody in this room knows about that. And see, this is the thing about what I'm trying to do in terms of the critical aspect of this project. In other words, we spin our wheels a lot trying to reflect on what the computer is doing or what the computer can do or the capabilities of computers, what computers can't do. When really, the, I think the more important thing is to find these points of commonality between our experiences as you know, our experiences, in other words, those of us who are in the improvising domain of musicians playing and those of us who are in, who are in the improvising domain of listening to things and, 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 and then when we leave the auditorium, both of us will be in the position of, you know, trying to find chances and potentially, you know, missing out on some, maybe some pretty big ones. Uh, just as a as a sort of interesting point, how did we get to the end? I mean, I have an idea, but what do you, how, did we, how do you think we got to the end? What happened there? That's still a secret sometimes. Uh, we used to say it's, it's a grace comes from the gods or something sometimes. Huh? Well, it's kind of funny <laughs> because you know, well, yeah, Gnade. yeah, like grace, Gnade. Gnade. I don't know him from. Gnade comes from oben. Excuse me, I, I, yeah, yeah. I can't translate. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, someone can, yeah. anyway. It's a room full of it's, university uh, people. It's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> so of course, you can, you can, you can uh, talk about how we end before the concert. Yeah, we make a few bum, 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 then we end. But if we don't, is much better because if you really improvise and you have to think about something that will come, it's already a, something that prevents you really to concentrate what you're doing. But you can find that end and we found an end. For example, this time it was for me the end and we felt the same. But yeah, I think so, yeah. If you feel the same, it could be all right. And when you played that last note, I knew you would look up. I had no idea. I said, okay, okay of this is probably going to be the moment, right? It's going to look up and see, is this really the end? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's the end. It, it's, it comes very quickly. It's, that's the thing. And I've never been able to figure out how to get these machines to do that. Now, I mean, I've been, I've been making these things since 1979. So that's a long time not to know what that's about. And if anybody has any ideas, you know, send me an email. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not always clear how we know when to end any conversation. I mean, sometimes we know because the person leaves or slams the door or <laughs> says, I'm done. 
Um, but that's not what happens in typical conversations. And one of the things that we've been reading in our seminars is a lot of literature that talks about improvisation as a form of conversation. And one of the things you see, I think, very quickly is that conversation itself has so many of the features that we see in musical improvisation. When do you end? When do you not talk? When do you let someone else talk? Suppose someone you think you know says something you didn't expect them to say. Do you respond or not respond? And that seems to happen in so many of these, of the musical cases as well, where you're going on and having a conversation. Sometimes it's sort of familiar. You know, you kind of know where you are, and sometimes you don't know exactly where you are. And I, I thought it was interesting tonight with the, with the dynamics. Sometimes it played quite loudly, and sometimes Alex would play loudly and sometimes softly. It was all part of the, of the conversation. And what's, I think, extremely striking is that it makes sense. You know, you can, you can listen to it, or anyway, I could listen to it. I'm sort of curious about what other people thought. You listen to it, and it doesn't seem arbitrary. It's well, not could, determined, yeah. but it makes sense. Well, I could tell when it didn't make sense. And when mm. it didn't make sense, I would go over to the, and sure enough, the little box on, the, on Alex's piano had crashed. <laughs> so I had to turn it off, turn it back on. I mean, if you can't hear, you, you can't make a lot of sense in this music. Right. So the thing was that the little, little doodad on the front of the piano there is sending signals to the computer. And so then the computer is kind of looking at what he's doing. And, you know, and so it, you know, it had a bad, it had a bad night, I think, and so it crashed a couple of times. But you could tell because, hmm, eh, eh, something's wrong here. It's not, you know, it's going off on its own. It's being very quiet. You know, it's, you know, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't really doing what it was supposed to do. But yeah, I mean, we are at a stage now in, in the course as well where we've looked at subjectivity, we looked at power, we've looked at identity. And the thing that you talk about, we talk about conversations, we're not talking about the structure of language as an analog for the structure of music, no. We're talking more about um, how the structure of any interaction has certain features, and you'll, you'll find out what these features are as you engage in the interaction there. Sometimes there are power struggles, there are misunderstandings, there are impasses that arise, there are attempts by people to make sense of things. I mean, these are things that happen, you know, even without language. Mm -hmm. And so, but they're improvised anyway. And so this is what excites us, I think, about improvisation as a, a field of inquiry as an, as an aspect of scholarship. And, and that brings it together with you know, what we're doing musically. And so music is just, the, in other words, in a way, there's a kind of a laboratory. And while I'm, you know, I should probably confess, you know, while I'm you know, playing the music, you know, I haven't blanked my mind out or any of that kind of thing. I, 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 I like it. I like better at the point where I'm aware of everything I can possibly be aware of. You know, the blanking your mind thing. You know, I mean, you know, you, you know, that's how you miss your chance. <laughs> you know, so. Are there any? Uh, does anybody have any uh, uh, questions? You don't have to get up to the mic. You can just scream out if you like, or comments, or you know, anything. Got to scream it out. Is that Douglas? Yeah. yeah okay. I, I talked about the fact that you spoke about not knowing when to end. And uh, Coltrane was often accused of that. So I'm wondering if you're <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, wasn't, wasn't Miles Davis' solution to the Coltrane problem, just take the horn out of your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. I mean, the, 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 only thing that, the only way I can, I have two controls in this thing, basically on and off. 
<laughs> the rest is sort of tweaking like, you know, you see me back there, I might push a button. It's like, oh, you're playing too loud here. It's always a problem with the sort of adjustment of volume because volume is sort of a primary signal, you know? And so, but other than that, you can't do anything. There's, it, you know, this reason you can't control it. You can't tell it what to do. There are no buttons to push. You, you know, it's supposed to be communication by means of sonic gesture. And if it's not that, I don't feel I've really learned anything about the nature of music, which is why I got into this business in the first place. You know, if I'm pushing all the buttons, then, you know, what's the point? What I wanted to know about was not how the computer would do it, but how I do it, or how Alex does it, or how Douglas does it. And, you know, I mean, Douglas and I, I know we spent, you know, uh, hours and hours, days thinking about this together, you know, so. And it's, the conversation still isn't exhausted, I think. Yes, please. Could you say something about uh, how the trigger works? Does it have a choice? Of, is there a choice of events that might happen if there's a certain trigger? Well, you know, there is no certain trigger. You see, the thing is, exactly the same note comes at a very different time. So the thing is that, you know, it's, it's all about the context. That's part of, I think, what's meant by missing the chance. It's the, it's the um, what do you call it? The, Oh, I forgot that word now. I'm afraid of everything. But, you know, it's the context. Um, you know, zusammenhang. Yeah. That's it. Okay. And um, so, and, you know, and stuff hangs together differently at every second. So, <laughs> so the thing is, the same so-called trigger is going to make things behave differently depending upon how the machine is looking at that moment. You know, what it's, and where it's focusing its attention because the idea is it's, it focuses its attention inside of different places and emphasizes different aspects of what it sees as a total field of, you know, parameters. So, I mean, in a nutshell, that's the overall thing. So, you know, it's, uh, you could get, it, there are quite a number of layers, but that's how it behaves when it sees an input, kind of. It says, well, where am I in this process and what, what am I doing now? And, what are the other people doing? And uh, it creates this big field that says, well, I have a fair number of choices here. I think I'll do this. And uh, after that, you know, it's either a good choice or a bad one, <laughs> in a way, or, you know. Yes, please. What is the huge broad question? Is it the, about the social responsibility? Oh. And, and also the social responsibility component that apparently Douglas has been talking about for the past. Do you have any overall views on improvisation? Or? Yeah, uh, I mean, I could say uh, we learned from uh, Mr. Derek Bailey's book that improvisation in music is, made, is obviously the oldest uh, way of making music and at the same time uh, there is almost no real scientific research about it because the subject itself withdraws some kind of uh, real scientific definition and improvisation uh, if we don't speak about art anymore, and uh, I had something, George mentioned something, improvisation also in daily life, many situations, can be an expedient as well to get out of a different, of a difficult situation if you can have a good improvisational idea. It can even save somebody's life also, yeah, if you are really there and you can improvise to get out and exit of this. There are, of course, uh, some things which uh, are not so uh, good for improvisation. Uh, imagine a brain operation. There should be not too much improvisation on it. It should be a good plan because improvisation is an activity uh, that lacks of planning 
and uh, prefixed concepts, preparations, just happens in the moment. And in arts, of course, it makes the form in the moment it's done, it's created. Look about this social responsibility thing. No, I, I, we don't want to duck that. One of the things is not to think about social responsibility in the first instance as some very abstract philosophical idea. Social responsibility is certainly connected to being able to respond. And being responsive to someone is the beginning of social responsibility. And the social responsibility is always going to be part of an interaction. When you try to respond to someone, being responsible to them, to that particular person, one of the ways you tell is how they then respond to you. So when you hear the way they're playing, I think you see a very clear aspect of interactive responsibility, of the social dimension of responsibility. Because they're, they're, they are responding to what's going on, and they're waiting. That's, that's, this goes with the idea of not just blanking your mind. It's, it's hard to be really responsible if you're blank. But if you're thinking about the various options and the ways you might respond, where part of the response is not doing anything. Because often, or sometimes, social responsibility is expressed by letting the other person have their say. And it seemed to me that in the piece here, all of those aspects of social responsibility, trying to respond to what it was doing, letting it have its say, sometimes trying to influence what it would say, which is part of responsibility as well. When you think it might not be doing so well, you want to do something that helps it along, as you'd hope that someone would help you along. So all of those aspects of, of social responsibility seem to me expressed in this context of improvisation. And it's actually a deeper sense of social responsibility than if one has some very abstract principles that one knows in advance that are just fixed, don't take into account any of the individual actors or any of the individual contexts, and just, as it were, impose what the response is. That's not being terribly responsible. We've got time for one more question right now, guys, OK? OK, is that okay? I think that person right there yeah, is yeah. sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. I have a question. I just have also just one brief little story about knowing when to end. A friend of mine once told me, I mean, I, I imagine with two people, it's difficult enough to figure out where the end is. But a friend of mine once told me about improvising in a group of a large group, maybe about 15 or so musicians. And everyone knew it was the end. Everyone, everyone could feel it. Everyone could sense it but talk about sort of the grace, or in this case, simply just gravity, the trombonist's mute fell out. And that, that was the end. Uh, um, but my, my question is, um, why the piano? Um, what, other, what, what other things could maybe be, be used as an instrument? Um, and w what is it about the piano? I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a, you know, a relatively simple mechanism for creating t sound and creating tone on the piano. Um, but what, what, what could be you know, some of the possible ramifications of using this to, you know, on another instrument? Um, and, hmm. and, 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 you know, and yeah. Well, in terms of the, the research on improvisation, you, you'd have the same fundamental questions regardless of the instrument you, you use. Uh, you know, there are some particular reasons why. I mean, this relates not so much to improvisation, but to the composition part of this. Because in the end, this is kind of a composition. It's, it's an environment for improvisers that, got, that was composed. I mean, I had to you know, write a computer program. It's you know, a lot of work. So, and like playing, it's a lot of work. So it's a different kind of work. So, so um, when these projects started out, it was much easier to control uh, synthesizers. Um, but synthesizers at the time had rather wan sounds, and people still don't like them, although they've gotten used to them. Um, so, uh, and then the, the one version of this uh, project was a sort of a virtual orchestra project. There were about 64 different voices. And the reason why the virtual environment was interesting, you, you could imagine 
You, imagine if you had a, an orchestra where everyone could play every instrument. I mean, that was the original idea of, let's say, the art ensemble of Chicago, you know, the multi-instrumentalism idea where everyone played dozens of instruments. You had a sort of an orchestra in, in a group of five people. And then you know, the ACM, let's say you have like a, maybe you could have a hundred uh, multi-instrumentalists or something. And then you've got a huge orchestra of possibilities of the sort that you really don't have in, let's say, the common notion of the Western orchestra. Not because, well, for a lot of reasons for specialization, and, and also just because, you know, not that many people can play more than a few instruments. Now, but in the virtual environment, you could suddenly have 100 flutes just like that. So that, le that led to all kinds of possibilities. And, and uh, when I went to the piano, I had to give up some of that. Uh, first of all, among others, the microtonality you know, the old piece, you could play, you could have 64 different versions of C, all 10 cents apart, you know, <laughs> something like that. You have, you have all these tonics. You, could, you had lots of things you could play with for timbrely. Uh, you could blur the boundaries between timbre and rhythm and tuning. Um, but basically, the piano is an instrument that a, a lot of people know. Um, it has a you know, a lot of people know what it sounds like, even if they can't play it. Like me, I can't really play the piano. <laughs> so, but I can make a piano player. Now, and this, <laughs> and you know, it, it doesn't play as well as a lot of people I know, but it can play very quickly and very softly as a lot of things it does. Now, just to finish that off, because I know we have to go to the, the, the other part of it. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube now. There are all these robotic players of all kinds of instruments. I saw what Gil Weinberg down at uh, Georgia Tech. He had a marimba, and somebody else had a djembe that they were a robot djembe, and and there are lots of things. So I think there's, you know, there's dozens of different possibilities. Uh, um, you know, for a while the the piano was ready to hand in that sort of or, I don't know, is it at hand or ready to hand? I forget. Maybe it's a little bit of both. <laughs> so, so more than that, I think that, um, you know, it's, there, there wasn't any particular uh, reason to choose this one over another one. It's more like, you know, sometimes composers write piano pieces and sometimes they write orchestra pieces. So uh, I guess they're telling us that it's time to stop and um, we're going to have the final uh, part of the evening, the great black music ensemble, there's going to be a bit of a pause and a bit of a change of the stage, and I have to uh, take my little piano and computer away. And th thanks for listening to us, and uh, we'll see you in about 15 minutes or so.